Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar presentation. I'm Mary Beal, and I'm the Senior Director of Member Professional Development at NALP, and our webinar today is a teaching roundtable, Building Foundations for Practice in Law School. This event is sponsored by NALP, SALT, and IELTS, and we so appreciate those other organizations joining us today. Before we start today's presentation, I want to remind you about some features of the GoToWebinar technology. Some of you who have been on webinars with us in the past will remember that the interface is made up of two parts. First is the viewer window, where you can see the presenter screen, and second is the control panel. If you click on the grab tab, you can open and close your control panel. The audio pane provides your audio information. There are two ways to listen to the session. You can listen through your computer speakers or you can listen by telephone. We recommend the telephone if you're having any trouble hearing. Do enter both the access code and the audio pin. You'll be able to communicate with our wonderful panelists through the questions box. Type in any questions or any comments on the material that's covered and we'll add these to the discussion anonymously. If we don't have time to get to all the questions and comments, never fear. We will pass these along to our panelists afterwards and they can help you with your question. We are recording this session today for future viewing on all of our websites. With that very brief introduction, I'm going to turn you over to Zach, who's going to get us started. We're going to have a brief pause while we get ourselves set up here. All right, you're great. Excellent. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Allie Gerkman. I'm a senior director at IELTS, the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. As that name suggests, we, we at IELTS work to advance the American legal system, and we do that uh, through a number of initiatives across the, the system, including in courts and, um, and in law schools. And as part of my work, I oversaw Foundations for Practice. That is the project that we will be talking about today, that the panelists actually will be talking about today. Um, and so um, I wanted to set out for you the, the learning objectives for the webinar today. First, uh, our webinar will introduce the information we've learned from our Foundations for Practice project. Uh, Zach Demiola, my colleague, will be walking you through the highlights of the findings so that we're all on the same page as we get started with this panel discussion. Second, we will showcase how law schools across the country are currently using the foundation study. And third, we will explore new ways in which the study can be used. Uh, today, we really, uh, the, the presentation on Foundations for Practice will be kept short because what we really want to do is highlight the panelists and the different ways that uh, different people in law schools are using Foundations for Practice in the hopes that it gives others uh, ideas and inspiration to take the findings and do something new at their own schools. Um, after we have the panelists walk through and talk about the ways that they have been using, um, using foundations for practice, we will have a, a short opportunity to do a little Q&A. I will also give you a little background on uh, the Foundations for Practice project and where it's headed now because while we have conducted the study and that is complete and all of that information is widely available for all of you to use, uh, we are actually in a second phase that we're excited about and we'll share just a little bit more of that uh, before we wrap up today. And so with that, I would like to turn this over to Zach Demiola who's going to take a few minutes to get you all up to speed on what you need to know about Foundations for Practice. Thank you, Ali. Um, my name is Zach Miola, and I am a manager at IELTS. I, I work with Ali on the Foundations for Practice project. And as Ali said, I'm going to just dive right into the findings of our study to make sure that we're all on the same page for this webinar. Um, you can learn more about our data and the methodology uh, for the study in our detailed reports 
And all those are available on the IELTS website. So IELTS created the Foundations for Practice project with three goals in mind at the outset. First, we could help the profession define exactly what skills or qualities they believe students need to be successful lawyers. Second, we could help law schools to adopt these skills and qualities into their own curriculum. And third, we could help employers develop clear and consistent hiring rubrics, taking all this information into account. So in other words, when we say align market needs with hiring practices, what we're saying is we want employers to hire based on what they tell us is important for new lawyers. We surveyed lawyers across the country and we received over 24,000 valid responses from attorneys in all 50 states across a wide variety of practice settings, from private practice and in-house counsel to government attorneys and public defenders. From a list of 147 different legal skills, professional competencies, and characteristics, our respondents identified 77 foundations that they believe new associates need right out of law school. And this is what the top 20 items chosen by practitioners across states and practice areas looks like. These foundations had the most number of respondents that said they were necessary right out of law school. And if you take a moment, you can see some of these are very fundamental, keep confidentiality, arriving on time, for instance. But what jumped out to us, the first thing we noticed at IELTS, was that only one traditional legal skill made the list, and that was legal research. Well, what were the other foundations? Professional competencies had a very good showing, and you can see here they're all highlighted in the top 20. Now, a professional competency is a broad uh, ability that's useful in any professional setting, not just uh, the legal profession. And finally, characteristics. In fact, respondents disproportionately selected characteristics as being necessary out of law school when compared to legal skills and professional competencies. And you can see characteristics include things such as diligence or conscientiousness. So the combination of the 77 foundations respondents identified as necessary right out of law school is what we call the whole lawyer. Ultimately, it takes more than just legal skills to make a good lawyer. New lawyers need a combination of foundations and we refer to the emphasis on characteristics among practitioners as a need for character quotient. We also asked our survey respondents about developing these foundations and what students could do to demonstrate that they had them to future employers. Now, we didn't ask, how do you currently hire new attorneys? Instead, we wanted to know what it would look like if employers actually hired based on what they just told us they needed. So here's what we found. Respondents identified 17 different hiring criteria that would help them determine if a candidate had foundations that, that they were looking for. And no one thought any of these were unhelpful. Uh, some were just relatively more helpful than others. And I'm sure a lot of these look familiar to, to our audience here, the law school attended class rank journal experience. But here's what's interesting. When you rank these from most helpful to relatively less helpful, here's what it looks like. And what's interesting is that experience matters. Many of the most helpful accomplishments are based on some sort of practical experience. As you can see here, we've highlighted those in red rather than academic or personal experience. So overall results show us that previous legal employment is one of the most helpful criteria in hiring new lawyers. Other examples are, for instance, legal externships, other experiential education, or clerkships. Now these results you see here are constant across law firm sizes, different practice groups, and there are very few variations. So for instance, law firms with over 100 attorneys do emphasize class rank and law school attended more than others, and they move up on this chart for, the, for those employers. Well, public defenders, for instance, emphasize clinical experience more than others. But the practical experiences highlighted in red here are still in the top 10 for all practice settings and firm sizes. Now, this information may be helpful for students to be more employable, but also better lawyers for their clients. So how are law schools using what IELTS has learned through foundations for practice? Well, I'm going to turn that question over to Chrissy Cerniglia right now. Hi, everyone. Um, before I start, I just want to take a moment um, and really address and be mindful of those people who are under the impending threat 
of a hurricane. Um, we are sending you energy. And although we feel like we are in a virtual world, you, I want you to very much know that we are sending you energy and support um, everything that you need right now, hopefully. Um, with that said, we are really excited about this moment um, that is coming to fruition. Um, we are excited to hear that over 179 um, registrants for this particular webinar are present and here and, and want to learn more. And so part of this um, has come to fruition um, really just through some hard work and energy and commitment of everybody that you're about to hear from. Um, I, as somebody um, who is a firm believer in the Foundations to Practice um, study, I have been using it for a while, but I get really energized when I hear about how other schools are using it. So, Zach, if you go to the next slide. Um, what it has done for me is I literally think about this conceptually. So our law school experience basically travels across this continuum, right? And it is a linear experience for our students. And it usually starts at orientation or in 1L year where we are building doctrine and we are teaching through sometimes a Socratic method, sometimes we're integrating experiences. And then they go out after their first year, uh, first year and we release them into a summer experience, um, which can be structured or unstructured. Um, and then they come back on campus usually in their 2L year and we build more doctrine and theory. We have sometimes upper level courses um, and those upper level courses might be ex externships or clinics. Um, and they keep traveling through more experiences going back out over the summer. Um, and it might be through um, career development through that 2L summer experience um, where they are doing on campus interviewing. Um, and they are out literally about learning and how they're learning and how they're gaining experience is something that is really interesting to study. Um, and then of course their 3L year, <laughs> you know the mantra, um, sometimes we bore them to death in their 3L year. And so what's interesting to me is we are now living in an era where we now have learning objectives and um, learning that are dictated by the ABA that we have to produce. And schools have now started publishing those learning objectives and the administrators and dean's offices and faculty across the country are trying to figure out whether all of these experiences operating somewhat in siloed portions are being able to further develop students toward those learning objectives. So there's an all-encompassing feature that the administrators now have to figure out um, whether or not they are assessing these experiences in a way that further that development. But we're doing it many times through a siloed lens and a siloed approach. And what I love about the foundation study is it actually allows us to break down some silos. Um, Zach, you can go to the next slide. And start looking at it from a horizontal perspective um, and share a common vocabulary. So what you're about to hear today, um, and this is our, our nice animation about breaking down silos, is really trying to figure out ways to integrate and talk in a common vocabulary with employers, career development, um, first year professors, externship coordinators, externship professors, experiential deans, um, and then our task, the collectively, um, geared toward assessment. And so what you will hear is how other schools are doing that and how some professors are integrating the foundations to practice survey in their class and requiring it as building this common vocabulary. There is not a better way for me to hand this baton over than to hand it to Dory, who will share with you how she uses the survey. So I hope you're all as excited as I am. Uh, all right, hello, uh, I'm happy to be here. I am Theodore Pina. Um, at Santa Clara. I, I had seen um, Christy's slides a few days ago and I said I, it's kind of a tough act to follow after a gift, but I don't have any animations quite like that, but I'm going to try. Um, so the, um, this came to be, I was giving a presentation at a, um, at a conference and referenced uh, the foundation's uh, study that I use and Christy um, kind of ran with it from there and, and so here we are today. So next um, slide, Zach, let's just Go ahead and jump right into it. Um, I do teach, uh, I am the director of the externship program, so I teach and uh, am responsible for that, um, that curriculum within the, within the externship classes. And then I also teach a um, first year, Santa Clara just started a mandatory first year required um, critical skills class, as we call it. So uh, between those two classes, um, the foundation is, um, the, their study is, is crucial to me. It's, it's, it's what I teach. Um, I, I think it's, um, um, necessary to, to say that that's, that's, you know, that study is really 
lays the foundation of, of what to teach, of why to teach it, number two, and then it also provides a common language, and I'll go through um, each one of these individually. But as that slide says, it really does set the tone for externship classes, and then in a minute, I will talk about um, also setting the tone for a first-year um, professional skills class. So um, next slide, Zach. So um, the foundation um, tells us what to teach. And that's a, um, a quote directly from the very, I think, beginning of, of, the, um, of the study. And it's, it's as, a, as a clinical professor and as, a, as an externship professor and then a, a, a professional skills, what I see is that um, what I've seen an awful lot in talking to colleagues and going to, to, um, to, to, to conferences is that there's sometimes that we sometimes struggle on on what we teach. You know, what what are professional skills? How do we teach them? How, you know, what is an externship class? What should we be teaching there? And for me, um, when I came across this study, I really did find it uh, life changing in the sense of my classes. So I mean, I practiced for years and years as a practicing attorney, as a civil litigator. So I knew all of these things. I knew what first year associates need to needed to come in with. But this study um, gave me the way to be able to say, aha, this is not just in my head. This is now going to be able to be translated for students. And Zach, at the beginning of this um, webinar, he gave you all those statistics. I mean, it's, it's, it's impressive. It's 24, you know, it's not just what I think or, you know, my Uncle Harry thinks. It's they went out there and did all the hard work for us. Um, and so what we should be teaching is, to me, um, are the competencies identified by legal employers that first-year associates need, that first-year associates need to show up with. Because what we also know um, through um, Neil Hamilton for those of you that have been to the Halloran Center or are familiar with his book, he would tell us that um, you know, the two uh, common threads for all law students are um, bar passage and meaningful employment. And so that meaningful employment, I mean, bar passage, they're going to be able to get that through their doctrinal classes, but how do they get to meaningful employment? And for me, that foundations, um, being able to teach what first-year associates need when they show up, that's what we should be teaching in externship courses, and I'm going to say, too, in also those professional development courses. Um, next slide. Zach. So, and, and here's why. So, in the same way, I think um, that my students need buy-in. So, when they, because they, they bar, you know, bar passage is one of their goals or law students' goals when they show up, students buy into their doctrinal courses. So, even if they can't stand, and I'll just take myself, for example. So, when I was in law school, and, and no offense to any trusted and estates attorneys out there, but I really just did not like trust, like, trust and estate. I did not like that class. Um, but I bought into it because I wanted to pass the bar exam. So, here I am, and so what do I need to know in order to be successful? Um, but for our courses, for externship classes, and for um, first-year critical or lawyering school classes, professional development classes, it's sometimes hard to get students to think that they need that class. A lot of times, those professors, or, or we as those professors, get a lot of pushback from students being like, I don't like this class, I don't need this class, why am I paying for this class, so forth and so on. And what I'm showing you here is, and I apologize, the slide might be a little bit, uh, might look a little funny in that sense, but I, I just wanted to show you You'll see up top it says that this is my externship seminar, and it's my Law 705 class. Uh, we meet at, in, a, in a classroom. Um, it's a one-unit class for your first time that you take an externship. And once I started using the foundations, and I really want to show this because I get, um, I get that buy-in. Students will now take that class, an externship seminar, and say, as you can see, um, they will, and again, this isn't like two students that gave, you know, you say, oh my gosh, she filled out that form herself. It's really not that case. I had really good buy-in, even in the sense that I think it was, it was a 69% um, rate of uh, people, students who filled out this, um, this evaluation for me. But they really say that I designed a course that was challenging for them, and it's not, I, I really, it's not that I didn't, it's just that I stole material from the foundation study. Um, they told me what was important. So now I get to say to my students, hey, listen, I think you need these competencies, but don't just take my word for it. Okay, these are your legal employers. These are who you're going to be applying to in a couple of years or in a year or so. Listen to what they have to say. Listen to what they want you to show up with, the competencies that they want as a first-year associate. Here's what they are. And so my classes are all designed around those competencies. And that's the buy-in. The buy-in is not just me, hey, you need this, the buy or, or a speaker coming in saying, hey, you need this. It's, it's the foundation study saying, it's not just I that think you need this. Look who says you need this. So let's pay attention. And, it, and it, I want to say it works, but it works. I, I get that buy-in. And once I get the buy-in, now I have their attention. Once I have their attention, now I can teach. Um, Zach, uh, next slide. So what to teach, why to teach it, 
Um, and so now, you know, um, the, the third bullet on there is that, that common language. And so for me, again, there's just a lot of different, I've spoken with a lot of different um, other directors or externships or a lot of uh, professional development courses that are out there. And there are a lot of different materials and topics. People are teaching everything from mindfulness, wellness, observation. I just got something on the listserv a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, I'm teaching a, a professional skills course and I want to teach emotional intelligence. You know, and, and again, all of these are important and I'm not saying, you know, I won't rank them in importance. Certainly all of our students need these, um, need these skill sets. Certainly that's true. Uh, but for me, it's that common language because like observation, for example, that's going to go into one of their competencies that they've listed in foundations, right? That's active listening. Uh, it's part of observation. It's part of listening, you know, and so again, oral communication, teamwork, um, emotional intelligence. You're not going to get through um, active listening skills, for example, without a, a high degree of emotional intelligence. So you can certainly hit on all of these topics, but giving students that common language that employers want to hear. They, it's going to be, I, I'm going to argue that it's going to be a little hard to go into an interview and talk about your wellness or go into an interview and talk about the fact that you're mindful. But you can go in an interview and start using the, the language that employers use, which is those languages of competency. You can refer to your active listening skills. You can refer to teamwork. You can refer to oral communication. You can, so you can refer to the competency. Um, and these, these sort of sub-competencies, if you will, or these sort of topics sort of all fit in. Uh, but focusing on that competency is what's going to make that student appeal to that legal employer using that common language. And I do also know, um, or think anyways, in talking to a lot of colleagues, that there again, there's a, there tends to be an over-reliance, especially in externship classes, I think, on outside speakers, because it's a struggle of what to teach. You know, what do I teach? Or let me get some speakers to come in. I, I, I don't do that. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not an advocate of it, as you can see. Um, and, and again, the struggle with what to teach is, 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 is by focusing on the competencies that we know students need, um, that first-year associates don't show up with, that helps us say, hey, this is, this is what you need, and you don't need the outside speaker to give gravitas to whatever material you're trying to teach. The gravitas is the, is the study. The foundations have done that for us. They really have done the hard work for us, and as teachers, it's, it's us to delivering that material to students. And then this last um, bullet, when I first showed up to, to um, Santa Clara, we had uh, fragmented externships. For those who don't teach externships, what I mean by that is that our class types, our classes rather, were based on types. So when you take an externship, the ABA says you have to have a, a, a contemporaneous class component, so you have to take a class. And often what um, externship programs will do in law schools is that they'll fragment them based on externship types. So judicial, they'll have an externship class for judicial students, they'll have an externship class for criminal law students, they'll have an externship class for you know, civil law, whatever it is. And I don't do that. All of my students are in one class regardless of their externship type because we focus on the competency. And regardless if you're doing criminal, civil, nonprofit, high tech, whatever it is, that competency stays the same. The foundation study didn't say this type of lawyer needs this and this type of lawyer needs that. No, they said first year associates need these competencies. So it makes it nice in that sense, in the sense that all of those students need those same competencies. And that's what I focus on. So I think that common language is, is really important and I think it's very helpful too. So um, that's for me for externship classes. And again, all of that also refers, um, Zach, next slide, please, also refers to professional skills classes. Um, what I've noticed, we here at Santa Clara just started again, we're, for, we're one year in to require a mandatory first year critical lawyering skill class, a professional development class for 1L. And so numbers, what I just went through, number one, two, and three, the what to teach, the why to teach, that common language, it certainly applies to professional development classes too. If you're teaching 1L though, and I've, I've, I'm coming into this, um, is that they're in a different place than, um, externship students. And so for one hour, you sort of have to back them up. And um, again, being a disciple of the, of the Holleran Center, meeting that one hour, meeting the students where they are. And so for a one hour student, meeting them where they are is, is going a little bit further back, if you will, than you are with externship students who are two L's and three L's. So for those one L's, that where they are is their first legal experience. They come to law school and I'll tell them, and like for right now I'm teaching part-time students, and they are all over the place. I have patent engineers, uh, excuse me, patent agents. I have a PhD in my class, of, you know, and, and someone who just came straight from, from undergrad. So the skill set in, that I'm teaching is really, really varied. But what I tell them is that the one thing I know that they all have in common is they haven't yet had that first legal experience. Um, so that's the, the context. That's the frame that I come from. And again, it's still using the foundations. It's still using the competencies that they've identified for me. And it's just delivering them to one else in a slightly different package. And again, it's just meeting the 1L where they're at, um, which you got to meet students where they're at 
no matter where they are, first years through, through third years. Um, so foundations for me has been um, a game changer. It's, it's, I want to say it's made my life a lot easier. I, I actually like reading my, my evaluations now at the end of semesters. Um, <laughs> students are buying in, and I am just uh, yeah, a big fan of the study and, and of the work that, that they did. And that's it for me. All right, I guess this is where I jump in. Um, so thank you for having me, and I'm glad that um, this was scheduled for a Wednesday today so that I don't miss it as a result of the impending hurricane that is approaching Durham, North Carolina. Um, hopefully it will continue on its southern track and not do too much damage here, but we'll see. Um, but we will be fine. Um, so I am the Assistant Dean of the Career and Professional Development Center here at Duke Law School. and um, I really, I, I've used this study um, in, in two main ways. One is to engage um, our students and one is to engage our, our faculty. And so I'm going to start by talking about um, how we use it in connection with our students, specifically one else. So Zach, if you could go to the next slide. So I think a lot of what I'm going to say on some level will echo a lot of what Dory said um, in the sense that this, I really have used the foundation study, I've, I've integrated it very deeply into the 1L core programming. Um, and, in, and we don't have a required core class as of yet. We'll see what happens in the near future. Um, but we do have a series of programs throughout the year um, for students, for 1Ls on professional development. Um, this study, I believe it came out shortly after I started or right around the time when I started at Duke. Um, and so I feel like this study, this study is very personal because I think it has actually shaped a lot of how I think about professional development. Um, it also came at a time where as I had just started, um, I was starting to get into all these conversations with you know, particularly with employers about you know, what it is that they want to see from our students and what it is that they're not seeing, um, but also internally um, with members of my department who, you know, we all work very closely with the students um, from faculty. There just seemed to be a lot of common themes across the board. Um, and so what I decided to do with this study up front was incorporate it into um, our second required program of the year. Um, and, and that program is really structured around this study. So that program is our professional communication program. Um, and I came at it from this approach because I think one of my biggest takeaways from this study um, was not just identifying what the competencies are, um, but it's, it's thinking about why those competencies are so important and specifically what it is that you communicate when you display these competencies or when you don't. Um, Obviously, I had to distill the study because it's it's a large study, um, and I decided to focus on the top ten skills that were identified as necessary in the short term. Um, I didn't I don't spend a lot of time on characteristics in this program because I just it's not you know getting into like whether you have integrity is not something that I can focus on really in a one hour lunch program. Um, but but by using these competencies, um, I'm able to. Um, distill a lot of the basics that we think one else need to know um, and and do it in a way where, as Dory said, hopefully they're actually listening to us because, again, it's about the buy-in. It's me standing in front of the room and saying, don't take my word for it. You know, listen to these 24,000 plus lawyers who have identified these things. Um, the list here is really great because it makes it seem very manageable for the one else. So I'm not telling them, here's a bunch more stuff that you have to pile on your plate, right, when you're trying to learn how to do law school. A lot of these are very simple things. But I also think it makes it very effective to get up in front of the students and say, you, you think <laughs> You think that you know about arriving on time. You think that you understand, you know, that it's something that we should do. And yet, clearly, many, many lawyers out there are saying that arriving on time is, um, you know, something that's important and maybe something that they're not always seeing. And so let's, so I, I use that as a way to hopefully open their minds to learning professional development generally, that maybe some of the things that they thought they knew coming into a professional school, they don't actually know, or, um, you know, the expectations are higher once they're in professional school. And so, like, again, like Dory said, kind of bringing it back to where they are at the very beginning, but, but trying to break them out of any preconceived notions that they have um, coming in. The other thing that 
I've done with this study in this program is I actually co-present with a member of our legal writing faculty. Um, and the reason for that is these competencies, what we've, we've, what we've explored and what we really want to communicate to the students is these competencies are equally important to be successful in law school. And in fact, learning them to be successful in law school is how you then learn them in your first legal job and beyond. Um, and so having faculty buy-in in that program, I think, um, makes it seem less siloed. Like in the first the animated slide that was so cool about you know breaking down the silos, that we're not teaching them something that's supposed to be in a vacuum. We're teaching them something that's important for their classes, for their activities, for their summer jobs, for their careers in general. Um, so that's really what we do with the 1Ls. Um, the second way that I use this study, um, Jack, can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is a bit dated at this point, um, but I, I use it to make a broader point. Um, this study has been incredibly helpful for us to engage with our faculty, um, partly just because it's data, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's data. As, as, as much as you can turn things like characteristics and competencies into data, this is it. Um, the study shows that building these professional competencies is becoming as important as the more traditional substantive aspects of law school. And I think this is something that's I, I'm going to imagine that a lot of schools are dealing with this in that law school is very traditional. Um, law schools tend to have very formal curriculums, and I know this is changing, but um, it's a profession that e has evolved a lot from um, a very intellectual and sort of elite profession into one that's a lot more engaged with the rest of the world and integrated into different industries and markets. And so, um, Although I think that the vast majority of faculty are very much on the same page as us in terms of how important it is to incorporate these professional competency aspects into an overall legal education, we're in a we're in, we're just we're in a very traditional, very structured environment, and and change is hard. Um, and so, what we did to kind of explore these issues more deeply with our faculty is put together a I called it a proposal that's really a very loose loose use of the word proposal, um, but kind of just a report to show the faculty to distill this study for them if they weren't already familiar with it, um, and then start a dialogue about how um, we can be working together to incorporate these different things um, into the entire law school experience. Um, and I will say that our faculty curriculum committee is we're moving towards the professional the more formal professional development program um, and I think that having a study like this that really does identify a lot of the same learning objectives and learning outcomes that we use for our doctrinal classes um, I think will be instrumental in executing this um, so that's that's really how I've used it um, again I, I think a lot of it echoes what Dory said but but I really I, I think for me the most important thing getting back to the 1Ls, but also overall is using the study to teach them why these things are important, not just what it is that they need to learn, um, but, but exploring with them, taking the study as a starting point and exploring with them, okay, now we have this data, what does it mean? What does it mean that you need to learn? Um, and why are these things important? And I think when you get to the why, that's when you really start to engage um, the 1Ls from day one. And that's what I have, so I will turn it over to Paul. Great, thanks, thanks, Julia. Uh, happy to follow up. Oh, uh, there we go. That uh, looks like me. Yes, yeah, so I'm Paul Holland, Vice Dean and Associate Professor of Law at Seattle University School of Law. As a teacher, as a member of the faculty, you know, I, I love uh, the content that's emerged from foundations, and I love the conversations that I've had with my colleagues in, in the clinic and externship programs, which are similar to the ones that you've already heard about, so I'm not going to uh, revisit that, except to, to just, just note that we have been able to um, extend that group uh, to include our, our librarians and our, our legal writing faculty, uh, so that our legal writing faculty are in the first year asking students um, to look over the, the list of, of characteristics and to highlight those on the list that they think they already bring, right, right when they're starting, 
to look at those that they think they might be able to attain within the particular course that they're that they're taking and those that they know it's going to take some time so that they, they get this conversation going early, that they really do conceive of law school from the beginning as not simply more education, right? But it really is a it's professional development. And so we really do see that transition, not merely as students. We need them to be students, um, but we also need them to be professionals from day one. And, and the foundations has given us a chance to do that. But what I think I can add to this uh, conversation is more in my, my other role, my vice dean role, where among my responsibilities is to make sure that we are doing assessment of learning outcomes, as all schools now are required to do. And within the last week, right, I've had two, two occasions to really be engaged with that. The first was our initial faculty meeting of the year uh, in which we were presenting uh, the data from last year's assessment activity, right? We assessed one of our learning outcomes and as the cycle of assessment goes, you tell the rest of the faculty, you know, how students performed on the particular uh, activity that was chosen to see how well they were doing with the outcome that we've identified and then discuss what we're going to do to adapt to those results. How do we feel about the results? Are they actually acquiring the skill? In this case, it was a, a skill about you know, sort of very basic legal skill, right? To be able to identify which of the various arguments that might be available in a particular situation is likely to be the strongest and to coherently explain and make the case for why that would be so. We did that through our con law course and we had this discussion in the faculty. And, you know, these are things that as in charge of the academic program and assessment, you know, I have to make sure we're continuing to do. The university requires it, the ABA requires it. The faculty, they are not yet fully crazy about the idea. They, you know, they, they do see it as some members of our faculty, as I think are true at many schools, you know, see this as something akin to a compliance exercise, you know, where we're just checking a box to show people that we're performing this task. Um, but it really is, you know, potentially so much more meaningful. Um, and, you know, the other experience I had recently was after the faculty meeting, went to the ABA workshop on site visits where they hammered us away again about assessment of learning outcomes. And what I'm going to talk about in these next couple of minutes is the opportunity my school has had working with IELTS to uh, get past that mere compliance and really make assessment of learning outcomes something that is integral both to our educational program but also to students' employment. So, Zach, you could uh, hit the next slide there because what we've been able to do in what's this second stage of BIOS is to extend the conversation now and to have a direct engagement with the employers in our area. Some of them may have been original respondents in the, uh, in the study, uh, but most of them probably were not. But we were invited by IELTS to take part in this process whereby they would uh, convene a group of employers in our area uh, selected by us, uh, then we would, um, we would have a, a group within the, the law school uh, faculty and staff in, in important positions related to the foundation to also discuss the results of the study and then the two groups would get together and and this conversation right now we're at the point where each of those two separate conversations has happened uh, and then we will soon have the the big convening the joint one uh, where we will be able to uh, build as a, as a slide suggests, a shared framework where we'll be able to actually really hear from the employers not just you know how they might have responded to the survey, but how it looked to them, their feedback on it when they saw the results. And we have already spoken to, you know, we, we actually, Zach, why don't you jump two slides ahead? Right, so we, we identified this group of employers, as I noted, uh, consistent with the report, but also with our own interest in wanting to make sure we were talking to the entire legal community in our area. The group was diverse in, in both the size of the practice, the nature of the practice, public, private, government, nonprofit, big, small. Uh, and you know, we got really, really strong feedback from, from those folks that we had tapped to this, that, that the conversation was really interesting it was enjoyable you know and some some firms and some organizations i think have these conversations within themselves more systematically on a regular basis i think many don't um, and so the report initially and then this opportunity to engage with the report has certainly uh, created a buzz within our legal community that, that now the foundations are part of the jargon they're things that we can refer to that are uh, our career services people can refer to, that our students can refer to as we train them up in this language. We're essentially 
you know, planting the seeds for this conversation so that we are working together on what matters, right? And that's what, uh, what this opportunity has really given to us. And Zach, if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about uh, what we did within our internal group, right? So we created a, our own team, likewise diverse in terms of perspective and experience and responsibilities. Uh, and we then, since the employers had gone first, uh, Ali and Zach came to us with those 77 foundations arrayed. I, we couldn't have fit this on a slide in any way that would have made it uh, useful for folks watching on a screen. But, but you can imagine on a, on a board with, you know, sort of pin, you know, a pin cushion kind of board with all little post-its or tags, all 77 foundations, but clustered thematically, which we'll show you in a moment, um, based on the observations, the things that made sense to the employers and how they all fit together. And that was really the key, was how they all fit together. I do want to go to the next slide and just show you sort of our team. Um, so you can see I was there as academic dean, had a member of our, our doctrinal faculty, someone who actually had been very engaged with the profession throughout her time with us and has developed a, what we call our transactional community of practice. So she's brought employers into the, into the curriculum for both you know, guest lectures, but also into the school for lots of presentations around transactional practice. Uh, the director of our legal writing program, which does more than just teach writing and research, but actually does provide the first introduction to the foundations through professional skills elements of the first year course. Our externship director, who takes an approach very similar to what you heard from Dory, our Access to Justice Institute, so our public interest uh, clearinghouse, and then our Center for Professional Development, our Career Services Office. So those, again, that's an opportunity there. You talk about, you know, silos. We're a group that does tend to get together anyway, but the, the foundations gave us this opportunity to construct our own thinking about how are we going to take what we learned from the employers, right? and use it here in the school, not just individually, but collectively. And that's what the, you know, the next slide will hopefully enable us to, to show you how, how we might get to do that. So these were, you know, with foundations in the middle, the five domains that the employers used to organize or that IELTS and the employers together came up with during their conversation. These five aspects of being a lawyer, right? From being a professional, a communicator, a problem solver, a learner, and a practitioner. And within those five, they were able to contain all of the foundations that were identified as essential for practice in the short term. And this, to bring this all the way back around then to assessment and how we can make it matter um, and, and really bring everybody on board, you know, this, I hope, once we've had that conversation with the employers and we've been able to share a little bit more about how we go about trying to build each of these capacities for our students um, and then how, how we can help the students signal that right, and demonstrate that they've got them so that the, the employers know that they're ready and they're the kinds of people that they want to hire. We can then finally have a theme to our assessment of learning outcomes that isn't merely Let's do what the ABA requires that we do. We'll throw in one that's tied to our mission. No, we're going to do the things that are going to make whole lawyers, right? Make lawyers who are ready to enter and succeed in the profession. And so that, you know, I'd love to be able to, to project out to two months from now when we've had that meeting with the employers to, to tell you all about it. But anybody who's interested can sort of reach out to me sometime later in the fall and I'll be happy to talk about it. I know we wanted to leave time for questions. So, I will tie up right there. Well, this Hi. is Alice. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of the panelists. I, I really enjoy hearing about all of the different ways that people are doing and learning things. And thank you to um, Paul and to Seattle U for participating in phase two. I wanted to just share quickly what, what phase two is about and what we'll be producing from it that will be publicly available. Um, and about when that will be publicly available. So we are working with four schools, including Seattle U, uh, and also including uh, the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, Columbia, and Northwestern. So uh, we're doing that, we're taking that same process that Paul talked about, we're doing it in four different schools and four different cities. And um, what, what we'll be doing is working with each school then to develop a a set of learning outcomes uh, organized, as, as Paul showed you, 
for that school, but we will also be taking what we've learned across the different schools and the different employment markets and developing from that a general set of learning outcomes and uh, also hiring tools that can be used. And we'll be publishing then those learning outcomes, hiring tools, along with a report that talks about the process that we use to get there so that other schools who want to engage with their employers in this way have at least a starting point um, to begin to do that. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Chrissy for Q&A. Yay, so I just wanna say one thing just to kind of bring it back. Um, this has been an incredible experience that really, I think Dory kind of launched it a little bit and inspired me to come back to you, Allie, and say, did you know how people are using it? And I remember you saying, I actually think, I, I don't know, right? And so what we're, we're energized about is hearing about the different ways that everybody has used it and then intellectually thinking through how it could be used in the future and maybe ways that we're not even thinking about it. So learning from each other has become kind of a new catalyst, I think, for all of us um, to think about. So that's one of the first questions, and, I, and that's somewhat of a transition to the question and answer. But one of the first questions, and uh, I'll probably posture this to Paul first, um, since you have the large overview, are, are there new ways you think the study can or should be used? Well, sure, and, and I, I think that the, the the next phase is almost implicit from the way this webinar was constructed, right, is to make sure that uh, picking up on Julia's uh, proposal and work with her faculty, right, to, to really show how it is both easy and valuable for these ideas to be part of the conversation in every course in the law school, to make clear that, you know, the idea of what's happening in you know, a, a doctrinal course or a seminar, the skills around preparation, attention to detail, being on time, listening carefully and respectfully, like all of those things, they're, they're, of course they are what people expect, but what, what faculty can do, right, is just make it explicit, right? So to recognize when someone has made a comment in class that shows that they were actually carefully listening to the last comment and not merely getting ready for their moment. Um, you know, simple things like that, means so much because the, the students will take such, they, you know, they take such strong cues from the faculty, right? And those things that faculty value, like getting the answer right, you know, then students really want to make sure they get the answer right. And the more that we kind of show these almost professional citizenship aspects of what, what, what the report tells us and make that clearly something that is valued everywhere within the law school, I think is really the, maybe the most significant thing that could actually change law school more broadly. So I'm going to step back from that and now kind of position this to Julia, who has the connection and overview from an employer perspective. Are there new ways that we should think the study, um, think about the study or how it can be, in, it can be used to engage employers and then connect to students and then connect um, larger to the larger campus? Yeah, um, I mean, I think one thing that we, we already have started to do and, and I want to continue to do is, um, you know, taking the study as, um, as data points, you know, we continually get anecdotal feedback from employers, um, particularly with in, around on-campus interviewing, but really throughout the year as they engage with our students. Um, and so lining up all of these different things. And so it's, it's really just continuing to take more and more of what we get using the study as a framework to interpret it and and i and i think that by doing that we just we just continue to strengthen this message and so that's something that i think we will continue to do um and and then what we haven't really done yet but i think would be interesting would be bringing the study back to the employers more. I, I actually have no idea how aware, you know, mostly we work with big firms, but how aware these firms are of this study and, and, and I'd be interested to kind of get their take on it and see how, how closely aligned this study data is with what they know that they're looking for, but maybe haven't articulated quite as clearly yet. Um, and I think Allie might have something to say on this, but I'm gonna wait um, and, and cue in Dory um, Dory, are there ways that you're thinking about using the study in, in different ways in your both of your classrooms? Um, sure, but you know, I'm going to answer that question by, by sort of backing up again um, and saying, I, you know, I guess meeting, meeting a, a clinical professors where we're at 
And so for me, um, you know, not enough, um, certainly externship classes and not enough professional development classes from what I've seen anyways, haven't, haven't adopted the study to begin with. Um, and so, you know, I want to kind of say that I, 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 I don't want to think about tomorrow until I can convince everybody to start doing this today. Um, so the study, you know, it, it, it should be used, it should be in, you know, the, the foundation, if you will, no pun intended, for, for professional development classes and for externship classes. So for me, I mean, I'm happy to think about, you know, how it may be used tomorrow, but I'm, I'm super interested in, in getting the buy-in and having, um, you know, people in my position in law schools use it today. And then um, if I can call upon Ali real quick, because Ali and I have these great philosophical conversations about, you know, how would the legal um, market change if, if we started using learning outcomes that were tethered and not so much um, concocted in a silo, but actually um, connecting, right, in, in a way that is really meaningful. And so I know you have a lot to say on this, Ali, and I'm wondering if you can kind of segue from there. Yeah, um, well, one of the things I'll note, so we've been doing a lot of work with employers, uh, both through the second phase of foundations, but also as we were doing the study, we were holding informal workshops to um, talk with folks and get reactions to feedback, so, or get reactions, sorry, to the study so that we could have a better sense of what we were seeing. And um, in, in general, what we what we get from employers is a lot of a lot of buy-in that that these are in fact the things that they want. Now, um, what what then is uh, on us to do when when we get that buy-in? In in my view, is to then push back a little bit and, and ask them about how they're hiring, um, because I'm not surprised there's buy-in in part because core competence documents from firms were one of the things that we looked at in pulling together the survey. So um, it's not surprising at all uh, that, that they would see things that resonate with them. The challenge is that often firms, and this is some, to some extent I'm talking about large firms here, but, but the truth is that the way the legal market works, it feels like large firms hire in a certain way and, uh, and other, other employers, <clears throat> at least We'll say on the private firm side may hire slightly differently, but to some extent they're they're looking for some of those similar similar academic criteria, right? So um, so I think it's broader than just the large firm question. Um, but but what we see is that they hire in a certain way, but then once people have come into the firm, they're um, advancing and promoting associates on very different criteria and and on criteria that actually look a whole lot more like what we see in the foundation study. So the trick will be to see if we can figure out, and this is one of the things we're working on in phase two, to see if we can figure out how to provide some useful tools to employers who are looking to make better hires in the first instance, because there is an interest there in doing that. Um, and that doesn't mean they're going to throw out academic criteria, right? And we certainly don't even ask them to do that. But what we would like is for employers to perhaps line that, that traditional criteria that matters to them up alongside some of these other some of these other characteristics and competencies that are going to be what what really make a a new a new employee sink or swim once they're on the job. So I'm gonna keep you on the line if that's all right and put you on the spot again. So we've obviously heard a lot about foundations to practice, um, and there are other studies out there, right? So Schultz and Zedek is, a, a, is an incredible study. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit, and there's a question that came in over this, of why use the foundations to practice study um, and how to use it in conjunction with or in comparison to other studies. And I don't know if you have an answer for that, um, but how you can tell maybe if there are some nuances here to think about. Sure. So I have a, a ton of respect for the Schultz and Zedek study. Um, and in fact, I mentioned that we use core competency documents from firms and pulling together um, the study that we did. We also uh, we also looked to the Schultz Zedek study and looked at the you know important competencies that they identified in pulling together the study. Uh, we also looked to McCrate, which was uh, an ABA initiative to try to identify what it what it is that that lawyers need to have. Um, we looked at s some others that have done been done by um, you know uh, other researchers 
in, in smaller settings, um, looking just at their regions. I mean, I think part of why we felt that there was a need for um, a study is that we felt like there was a need for a nationwide study where we could really um, take a look at the demographics of the respondents, um, break it all down, see if things show up differently, get a sense for, you know, Schultz Zidick was um, a, a study, a great, like I said, a great study of Berkeley alums. Um, we, we wanted through this to build on what they did um, and, and look at this through the, the lens of a national study. Um, so our hope is that this this study stands on the shoulders of many other good studies that have come before it, um, and that it's you know one more step, step forward in gaining a better understanding of what it is that that new lawyers need. So I'm going to segue, and I'm being very mindful of time as well, but I'm going to segue to Dory to see if she has anything else to add to that response because I know she equally has relied on Schultz and Zedek and now relies on practice and maybe giving some insight into how she uses both. Um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can just echo really what, what Ali just said because it, this, show, this study does stand on the shoulders of those studies and researchers that have come before it. So uh, in, in my class, actually, I have a slide and I, I show, um, I, Schultz Zedek, I have relied on that, those 26 effectiveness factors. Um, McCrate, I refer to that. Um, Neil Hamilton has done a lot of work in this area. I refer to him and then foundations, of course. And the nice thing is that it's not a compare and contrast because as Zach said when he opened this up, right, his first slide, he was talking about identifying the foundations that entry level lawyers need. And all of those studies in one way or another, um, you know, Schultz that I did look at Berkeley alum, um, foundations did a national study, they still all identified the foundations that entry level lawyers need. So these, these, these studies really do with foundations standing on the shoulders of, she's right, Ali's exactly right. So it's not a comparing, it's not a contrast. What I'm able to say is, look, the language might be different, so we're going to use, you know, arrive on time or, or keep competent. But the, those, the, for Schultz, for example, they have self-development as one of their competencies. Well, self-development is certainly going to, um, so the nice thing I like about foundations is that it, it, it gives you, I think, a little deeper, I think, uh, than Schultz, Zedek, and it gives you sort of a, a um, sort of a nomenclature that students, I think, uh, recognize a little bit easier. So self-development for them, they're easy to, they're able to say, oh, hey, I got self-development, what's the problem? I'm in law school, right? Um, but when you start breaking it down a little bit more, um, with a little bit more detail like Foundations does, you know, arrive on time, honor commitment, so forth and so on, I think it becomes um, easier for them to, to deliver the product for a professor and then easier for the student to absorb it. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of Schultz Zedek and all of the studies that, that, that have come before um, and I think, again, Ali is right, it, it, it stands on the shoulders and it's, it's a perfect complement too, because it just identifies those competencies that entry level lawyers need. And then I'm going to um, kind of posture this to Paul. Um, Paul, you said a, a quote or a comment in your presentation that said the faculty are just not akin to um, some of the assessment techniques. But I'm wondering if there's a way that you can comment on, on why this report at this moment and how um, you think it might be able to engage. Yeah, I actually, that, that was, as I was thinking, listening to the responses from the last question, you, you kind of got right where, right where my head was. You know, I, 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 I've used the other ones, McCrate, any clinician uses McCrate, uh, Schultz and Zedek too, very valuable. You know, part of what, what happens now is, is timing, right? We are, we are in 2018. We are, we are in this new law school experience, right, where enrollments are, are smaller than they were and hiring has gone through all the shakeout that we've had over the last 10 years. So having something that speaks to what lawyers need to both get and succeed at jobs now, right? It just, there's a, there's a credibility in that that I think makes it something that people will pay attention to. And I think it is something that opens up a conversation as opposed to an excellent but older report from some time ago, right? And it's just, it's, you know, it, it just suits the need for making sure that we're having these important conversations that we need to have right now using the terms and data that have been identified in this moment. I think that's the, the thing that gives us the, the best access for, for really opening up the minds of those who need to be dragged into the conversation. Um, and with that, I'm gonna somewhat close out and then I'll turn it over to Zach. Um, I'm gonna play on this power moment right now. We are living in such an incredible time legally, right? Um, we are seeing a legal landscape changing and legal issues changing um, and movements happening in, in really incredible ways that 
I think the silos do have to be broken down. I think we have to literally in this formation space of legal education, pull everybody together and brainstorm how can we do it better? How can we um, collaborate with each other in a really meaningful way to bolster the profession? And I speak um, literally from a place of passion. So I'll turn that over to Zach because he might have some administrative things. And I thank everybody for just being engaged and um, really um, thoughtful through this whole process. Thank you, Chrissy. Yes, thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you, Ali, and uh, also thank you for our participants for for uh, for listening and and paying attention to this important information. Um, we will be following up with registrants, sending out examples of handouts and other information, and of course, we will be answering uh, more of your questions in that follow up as well, so that we are sure to address your thoughts and concerns. And that's all we have. Thank you again. Thanks.